Disentangled, a novel by Pete Howells. Chapter One, In the Beginning. One dull thud of an heavy hammer should have been enough. But he struck her twice. He took her purse, ran off down Snicket across Burstall's yard, past pig pens, over fields and onto the main road. He was seen twice, according to old Bill. Once running across cobbles that led to Burstall's barn, dog had barked, apparently, and there Eileen had looked out at kitchen window. He was wearing black, she said, running shoes and an hood. She saw him chuck hammer into nettles at side of tractor. Jimmy Applethwaite and Chantel Tunstall saw him leap a fence, cut right across field and run down to the main road. They thought he were getting on a bike, they certainly heard one start up, and then saw headlights moving off down Denton Road in direction of Branley. It was dark, and they couldn't very far clothing or anything. But Jimmy said he thought that bloke's head were covered up. That one dull thud should have done no. Police kept saying that when they came round. Detective Inspector Walton was his name. And heavy hammer like that, he didn't need to hit her twice. Second blow caught her where skull meets spine, it broke her neck. That were unnecessary, even if he was desperate for cash. They reckoned it were a junkie that did it. He were either high at time or else desperate for another fix. He got 34 pence, a co-op divvy card, and a second-class stamp. So he'd be getting no fix if he were a junkie. That's all she had on her. 34 pence. Six and eight in old money. She always used to go on about that, my mum. Six and eight. That were how much a record used to cost when I were a lass. That's 34 pence in today's money. It were funny and all, six and eight. Because that's how old she was, 68. Not funny in a way that you'd want to laugh, but strange, like numerology. She'd had me when she was 39, and I was born at 9.30. Then she married me dad, after I was born. You didn't need numerology to work that one out. But I hadn't worked it out, not then. She used to say a lot of daft things, my mum. Stuff you wouldn't necessarily take notice of. There's always an anecdote to any poison, she'd say. And what happened to her with poison, I can tell you. Poison created by society. But it all stopped that night. For her it did, any road. They reckoned she would have been dead a second after that first dull thud. The second blow was unnecessary, they said. Kept saying it. Unnecessary. Smash and grab, pointless crime, hooded druggie could strike again, villagers warned. It were all in papers, local ones like. Old Bill was round for a few weeks, then it all died down. They offered me a bit of counselling, but I said no. They tried me with therapy when I was still at school and it didn't do any good. I said it was all a dreadful shock, but I'd manage. We weren't sort who needed counselling or out like that. But it were kind of them to ask. They never caught the bugger neither. To be honest, they lost interest. That night, the nights you were found, were dark. Dark with a wild wet wind. That kind of furious wind that makes you not want to stop at door when someone is talking to you. So you ask them in and then you feel ashamed, not ashamed, but embarrassed about state of house. Any road that came in. D.I. Walton with two big coppers and a small female one with blonde hair and nice lipstick and all. She just looked round house really while they talked to me. All four of us squashed in our front room. They were nice at start. Then they started saying I should own up. They went on as if it was obvious that I'd done it and they'd find weapon and my prints would be all over it and on a night like this they'd have footprints and it would be easier if I just told the truth. I said... I didn't know what they were on about, and they said, The one dull sort of an heavy hammer should have been enough. I know why they kept putting it like that. They were after a confession. But you only confess if it's you that's done it. Then it wasn't me. So I just sat quiet. Then I said, 
Is she dead? They said, she's dead all right. Second strike snapped her neck. Then I said, nout. I just shook and stared into what were left of fire. I remember two big lumps of glowing coal shifting on their own. They dropped and ground together, sending a few sad sparks of yellow light up sooty back at chimney. Then female one came back downstairs, sat on edge of chair and put an arm round me. She pulled me to her and I cried. <laughs> a grown lad like me cried. I haven't cried since I was a little kid, but it all came out. I could feel her bosom under her uniform, pressing on my face. It was soft, like a feather pillar wrapped in a mac. And the fire dipped again, without sparks this time, and that's the last time they accused me. I think they were just trying it on. 90% of murders are committed by a family member or close friend, they said. So... I suppose they have to go down that road at the start. Then she got back up, that woman copper, and stood over in front of mantelpiece, making room seem even darker. Main bloke were talking to me again. His voice were like them shards of a thorn bush, sharp and hard, liable to dig right into you, then snap. But I were having none of it. When you know it's not you that's done summit, you can focus on someone else, and that's exactly what I did. I just kept looking at that woman. She had a nice shape to her and all. All wrapped up in copper's black. My eyes went up to her face, and the only thing I thought didn't look right was her hair. It was too blonde for the rest of her. If she'd have been my missus, I thought, I'd have got her to dye it black. But she had nice lips and good cheekbones, and then she caught me looking, and her eyes changed. There were a flash of something. Something like something with power inside it. Something I'd never felt coming from any woman. Like frost. Like fire. So I looked back at bloke and I said, Look, it were my mum. She were the only thing I had left in the world. She looked after me and brought me up and that. So why would I... And then my eyes welled up. Like old Mother Shipton's spring. And they went down to the floor and back to the fire again. And by then she'd moved, moved away from mantelpiece. And that bit of panic, that fragment of fear, that tiny moment of terror went with her. They never caught him, though. I don't think they ever really tried. She were an old woman. She were no one important. And they were busy. That's the way it goes. There was an odd atmosphere in the village after that, though. People kept looking at people, strange-like. Muffled talk in shops, street and pub. First reaction of a lot of folk were to think that Stringy Billy was at the bottom of it all. Either he had done it, or he knew somewhat about it. People thought Stringy Billy knew a load of stuff he didn't know. He didn't know out, and that was truth. It wasn't Stringy Billy who did that to me, ma'am, neither. He couldn't have done it. And if he had, he'd have owned up straight off. That was how stringy Billy was. It didn't stop folk being wary of him, though. You get a murder in your village and you'll see. Everyone supports everyone. Everyone's everyone's friend. But only in that kind, concerned, Christian kind of way. Underneath, there's whisperings. There's pointings with nods, with looks and sideways glances. No one trusts no one. Because underneath, we are all capable of murder. And people know that. Underneath. Underneath, we could all take an heavy hammer, hit someone over the head and walk away as if nought had happened. It could have been any of us villagers, they all thought. It were none of us, they all hoped. I thought for years that they'd get the bastard who'd done it. But... Like I said, they lost interest. They found Hammer. There were no fingerprints. They found a black hooded jacket. But there were no fibres or nowt else on that could help anyone. Footprints on that wet night were too smudgy, but they reckoned whoever had done it had big feet. He were wearing size 12 trainers. Only Jimmy Gordon at Pubber's feet that size. And no one suspected him for a minute. 
I knew it wasn't Stringy Billy. Police gave up. Time moved on, but case remained open. There were many a night, though, when I'd look into a tired old fire and feel that ghostly shiver when coals moved. One day, one night like that could change everything, completely change your whole life. I thought of that uniformed bosom against my face, a blonde hair and bright red lipstick, and the voice of that big copper, saying, One dull thud of an heavy hammer should have been enough, over and over and over again. <laughs>